The natives of the tropical forests consider themselves to be living encyclopedias of the natural pharmacopoeia of the jungles. They know the secrets of thousands of species, but as they do not have writing in which to pass on their knowledge, it is transmitted orally from generation to generation. But when the jungles are cut down, the natives disappear with them, and the ancestral... And if the polyps are not renewed, the entire ecosystem simply dies. All the biodiversity of the ecosystem is based on the most delicate, tiny organisms of the reef, the coral polyps. These small architects are responsible for the construction and renovation of the Great Barrier Reef, and for this they produce over 100 million tons of calcium carbonate a year. This production serves to repair the inevitable wear and tear of acting as a break on the sea and generate sufficient limestone to construct 17 pyramids like that of Giza. But in order for the polyps to construct their fabulous calcareous armor plating, they need the zooxanthellae, single-cell algae that live inside them and thanks to which they are able to feed. The Sushanthale, represented here by the brown spheres, are vital for the growth of the corals, but they have a problem. They are incredibly sensitive to changes in temperature, and that is where our contamination comes in. The global warming of the atmosphere caused by contaminating gases is heating up the water of the seas. This increase kills the Sushanthale, causing the death of the corals. And without corals, the coasts of northeast Australia will be left defenseless against the brutal pounding of the waves. We are changing the climate of the planet. The global warming of our atmosphere is a fact. Our climate is gradually heating up. The glaciers are retreating. The poles melting. We are causing a global change of magnitudes similar to those that mark the great extinctions of prehistory. And paradoxically and sadly, we are in great measure doing so by burning fossil fuels derived from oil, which are hidden beneath some of the last virgin refuges of unspoiled nature. In a world in which man has taken over most of the land, Alaska is one of the few remaining refuges for wildlife. An extreme climate marked by very low temperatures and six months of perpetual night makes the territories of the north a forbidden place for the majority of human settlements. And until now this has been the life insurance of hundreds of animal species that live in a fragile, rich balance during the months of spring and summer in which the climate of Alaska declares a truce. With the arrival of the warm months, Alaska comes back to life. All the species must take advantage of the days free of snow and ice to regain energy, reproduce, and accumulate reserves for the following Arctic winter. Some, like the salmon, return to the rivers where they were born after a long season growing and storing fat in the sea.
Others, like the grizzly bears, come out of their dens where they have spent the winter in a state of lethargic hibernation and take advantage of the reserves of the salmon to satisfy their hunger of months. It is a season of surpluses in which the species synchronize their life cycles so that life is possible here where the climate imposes almost insuperable restrictions. And once again the fragile network of interspecies dependencies makes the miracle of life possible. Towards the interior, and as we move further north, the vegetation becomes increasingly scarce. The tundra gradually gives way to the taiga, vast extensions covered in sparse vegetation, adapted to a soil permanently frozen beneath the surface. Here, resources are so limited that there is virtually no margin for error. The few days on which there is food available must be taken advantage of, and even the slightest source of energy plays a role of vital importance. And that is what makes Alaska, like all the lands of the Arctic region, an extremely fragile place, where all these species live at the very edge of the impossible, adjusting their lives and adapting their biologies so that they complement each other. It is, more than any other place, an extraordinarily synchronized world, so dependent on these scarce resources that a small alteration could destroy the entire system. But that would not be too worrying if it were not for the fact that underneath this apparently poor land, there lies huge reserves of oil. An enormous pipeline runs across Alaska from north to south, from Prudhoe Bay to the Valdez coast. 1,300 kilometers of pipeline to transport the 20,000 million barrels, which is the estimated production of Prudhoe. The companies try their best to achieve clean extraction, but experience tells us just how easy it is to inflict irreversible damage on such delicate ecosystems. The Exxon Valdez catastrophe was a warning from which the Alaskan coast has still not recovered. The death sown by the 36,000 tons of crude oil spilt continues to claim victims 13 years later. And the Exxon accident was a mere drop in the ocean compared to the overall figures, because it is estimated that in routine operations of the oil industry, every year between three and four million tons of crude oil are spilt. Until now, the extreme temperatures of Alaska have meant that extracting the oil that lies hidden in the ground has not been profitable. But while new technologies are eliminating these technical limitations, the world's greed for energy places pressure on industries and governments to undertake new prospections. And in Alaska, one of the last virgin refuges of Arctic flora and fauna, the day is fast approaching on which the petrol companies will destroy its fragile, vital balance forever. We are changing the world. We are altering ecosystems, changing landscapes, wiping out species at a speed 10,000 times greater than that required by nature to make new creatures appear. 
Man is the new vector of change as meteorites and continental drift were in the past. And in this global process, we are all contributing to the change. Immersed in an artificial world that we have created, we now look at nature from a new perspective, which makes us see that the world has its limitations. In response, our more advanced societies with the best will in the world promote initiatives to protect and conserve the last remnants of virgin nature. But playing at being gods shows just how complex the network of life is and how complicated it is to move even a single piece of the intricate natural equilibrium. The Valdez Peninsula on the east coast of Patagonia in Argentina was once a center of the whaling industry. For decades, the harpoon ships devastated the populations of the southern right whale until they were on the very edge of extinction. And then our species took a step back and remedied its mistake. Since 1983, the Valdez Peninsula has been a sanctuary for the large southern cetaceans. Here, the large right whales rest and reproduce, and the numbers have gradually risen. But in our pragmatic world, conservation is only possible if it brings income for the populations of the places in which it is practiced. And so, along with the creation of the national park, the tourist industry was also developed. And this has proven to be very lucrative. So far, so good. But in this process, there were some elements that were not taken into account. And one of those was the seagulls. Seagulls and some other marine birds, such as the skuas and petrels, are great opportunists. Along the southern coast, they take advantage of all the existing food resources and, in an entirely natural way, they have fed on fish, bodies thrown into the sea, mollusks, and, in the breeding season, the chicks and eggs of a number of marine birds. These resources were limited, and this in turn limited the populations of these opportunists of the sea, until tourism arrived in Valdez. Today, there are so many seagulls which attack the large whales ripping flesh from their backs that the cetaceans have been forced to change their behavior. The growing numbers of tourists led to immediate growth in the towns and villages adjacent to Valdez. The hotels, inns, restaurants and craft shops multiplied, but no one controlled the waste produced by them and large waste dumps grew alongside the new settlements. These waste dumps became an inexhaustible source of food for seagulls and skuas, and their populations grew alarmingly. And today, paradoxically, the seagulls have become the greatest danger for the protected whales of the Valdez Peninsula, forcing man to seek new solutions. Playing at being gods has always been a temptation our species has been unable to resist. We use, change and upset the natural balances at will 
and in time, when we want to correct our errors, we realize just how complex the natural balance we have altered is. This is Yellowstone National Park in the west of the United States. Today Yellowstone is a sanctuary for wildlife where the animals live in freedom, multiplying their populations away from the growing development of the greatest world superpower in an apparently unchanging ideal balance. But nothing could be further from the truth. Yellowstone was the first national park in the world. Here the foundations were laid for the creation of a network of sanctuaries to preserve nature from the unstoppable advance of man. And in the case of Yellowstone, to save an emblematic American species from extinction, the American buffalo. Man was on the point of wiping out this species and man managed through Yellowstone to save it from extinction. But when the park was created, old enemies came face to face. Yellowstone is surrounded by cattle breeding territory and no one was fond of the most important predator in the reserve. An animal that could kill domestic cattle and which in nature was the only one capable of hunting the buffalo, the wolf. Despite its new status as a national park during the first decades after its creation, the wardens of Yellowstone persecuted and decimated the wolves. And playing at being guards, in order to save one species, they wiped out another one inside the protected area. In time, scientific knowledge has revealed surprising data. Not only had the wolves not wiped out the buffalo in Yellowstone, in fact, they favored the health of its populations. With the disappearance of the wolf, coyotes proliferated within the park, assuming the role of the main predator. But the coyotes were able to do very little to control the populations of large herbivores and plucking up its courage in an exemplary manner, the US Fish and Wildlife Service undertook the difficult task of remedying its mistake. Today, the gray wolf has returned to Yellowstone. Overcoming infinite difficulties and local opposition, the great predator has returned to its original prairies. And the first effects were rapidly seen. The populations of buffaloes, American elk and mule deer are recovering their genetic vigor. The coyotes, whose numbers threaten different local species of birds and rodents, have returned to their original populations. And the ecosystem, altered so many times by man, has returned to something more like its original balance. Today, the wolf of Yellowstone is now a symbol of hope, a demonstration of how our mistakes can be put right. We have changed the planet, devastating our surroundings and playing at being guards in a world whose functioning we do not really understand. But we have also reached a cultural, moral and scientific development that is leading us to correct mistakes. And new winds of hope are starting to blow in a world that needs help, and where the very future of our species is at stake.